we're all humans, you know what I mean? Like there's historical things that happen that made certain things the way they are, but hating another person or even even though it was a reflection, it wasn't like a natural thing. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Hating other people would never get me anywhere. That was comedian and radio personality, Larry Dorsey Jr. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. In this podcast, Larry picks up where he left off in part one, telling us about the schools he went to and the trouble he got in. At the same time, he was the type of student to chill out in the library reading books. He dabbled in acting and movie courses, but he really wanted to be a comedian. And he shares the story of how he made that happen. Larry also talks about how he came to be an on-air personality at KMEL. And he ends the podcast with his hopes for a San Francisco that finds its soul through youth and culture. Here's Larry. Like, I started being, becoming very curious about... about the predicament of black people and our disposition. I was like, yo, is this, who, ooh, Hummy burn, that's beautiful. I was like, is this, is this what we do? Is this gangster stuff? Like, cause that's all I was pretty much exposed to. Is this who we are? Is this what we, is, is this, this? Is this all we are? Is this our nature? Right. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. And I started, and I came back and a lot of my friends had, you know, they were dead. Like by the time I was 18, I knew like 37 people who were killed, right? Jeez. So I was like, is this, is this what it is? Like, you know, one of my best friends went crazy. Like uh, the police, two of my best friends, they, the police slammed them or did some beat, beat their ass. And then they, they kind of, they had brain damage Not and the they're same. never the same. Yeah. So I was like, why are we like this? And I started doing, I started trying to find out. I was like, well, let's see, let's see. It's like, we can't just be like this. When, when did this, when did gangster shit start? I started finding out the history of gangs. I started looking up the history of uh, all types of it and led me down a rabbit hole. Like, and by the time I was uh, like 2013, 2014, like 23, 24, I started getting heavily into activism. This is to me a version of when you're younger and you would go to the library. Kind of, yeah, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it's deeper, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it's, but like, it's like I don't relate to everybody. Even though I could get along with you, I don't relate because I feel like we're not really. We're just sitting around talking about stupid stuff. Like, I'd rather go to the library and write. Like a lot of time in the library, I wasn't even reading. I was writing, okay. writing, right, 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 right. Okay. And then I and then I'll pick up a book and read. You know, all types, Socrates and this and that. And um, I think that's part of the reason I got into law <laughs> because I spent a lot of time reading. But. Um, yeah, I started asking those questions and got deep into activism. And one of my friends actually was murdered by the police, but Bernard Peters Jr. And at the in San Francisco, in Oakland. Okay, but he's from San Francisco. Okay, sorry. and at the time that it happened, I we we like in the streets is something normal, like police police problems, police brutality. Back then, it was pre pre Black Lives Matter, so in our minds, it was just like, oh damn, his nickname was Red. Oh, he got killed by the boys. Damn, that's crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. that's it, you know? And so then I started realizing, you know, I was around the Oscar Grant rallies, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the Occupy movement. Mm -hmm. But that was all part of the process of, like, kind of kind of understanding what was happening. Mm -hmm. And then my friend died, and I still wasn't clicked in. And then I think I, I, when I went to City College is when it finally hit me. Mm. It was, like, 2013 or 2000, yeah, 2013, 14. And that's when the activism really hit me. Okay. And also I started experiencing so much racism in my life that I, that it was really, it was, it was so deep. Like some of the stuff I would feel, I would feel very ostracized in college. Like mm. I would feel alone. Like nobody related to me. Like people would be like, my smoothie, I didn't want it. And I'm like, I know three people who died this week and you complaining about your smoothie? So, like, I, I noticed white privilege, but I didn't understand what it was. Like, I was just like, y'all complaining about things that, like, even now to this day, that's why I don't get offended or hurt or anything. I'm mm -hmm. like, my dad used to get spit on in his face right. by racist people. Like, what do I have? My mom's from a third world country. Like, right. I have nothing to be offended about. So, um, but yeah, like, in college, I went to Academy Art University for film. I thought of it as an art school, and I had bad grades. So I was like, let's do that, right? I want to be in entertainment. Yeah. Um, I didn't know like the socioeconomic backgrounds that a lot of my peers were gonna be coming from. Right. 
And so I start I started associating with a lot. That was the first time I went to like a pr primarily white school, mm -hmm. and because Law was primarily Asian, mm -hmm. Aptus was primarily a. Uh, uh, Black or Latino, mm -hmm. and then my my elementary was just everybody, you know yeah. what I mean? And so going to the Academy of Arts, like in the acting and the film department, everybody was mainly white, mm -hmm. right? And so all my friends were white, and the, some of the conversations were like, I would be like, I would be confused because I had never met people with that kind of background <laughs> like mm. the shit they would tell me i'm like whoa like, like that level of privilege yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. like the the access and the opportunity and the things they came from and the the confidence they had yeah that was some of the deepest shit like yeah their confidence was outrageous and i was like damn you you're just like you'll walk up and like like one of my best white friends his name is drake and i owe him a lot because he uh I'll, I'll explain later why but i used to look and he's not even that much older than me but i used to love how he would talk to other white people because I had never seen some shit like that before. I was like, yo, he has hella confidence right now. Like, he's just like, no, this is how it's gonna be done. And I'll be watching like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so at the academy, that's kind of like what I picked up. And I went to a private theater school called the Meisner Technique Studio. Mm -hmm. That's where I picked up my acting chops. Is that here in the city or? Okay, yeah. pardon, my, pardon my ignorance. No, 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 it's all good. It originated in New York. There's a sister school in LA. And then my my teacher started one in San Francisco. Got it. And it's like it's a really intense school. Um, he's he changed my life, man. He he made me understand because I had like you know James Baldwin says you know when you're an educated Negro you're in almost in a constant state of rage, right? Mm -hmm. So I went through periods where I hated every race. Mm -hmm. Where I was like fuck everybody hates me and fuck I hate everybody. And going to acting school helped me. Like, I, I attribute this to Jim Jarrett and also a little Bob Marley as well. But I realized, like, you, you, we're all humans, you know what I mean? Like, there's historical things that happen that made certain things the way they are. But hating another person, or re even, even though it was a reflection, it wasn't like a natural thing. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Hating other people would never get me anywhere. Hating takes effort. Yeah, too, yeah, like right? that's not, that's, that's, and that's misdirected energy where I could just be focusing more love towards my people, right? Right. And so. Did he, you want to be an actor? Um, do you think, or did you, did, or no. you were just exploring all this? No, shit? I wanted to be a musician. Okay. But there was no school that mm -hmm. I really knew how, and the academy didn't offer that. They offer mm -hmm. music, music scores, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, damn, I don't want to do that. But I always wanted to be an entertainer, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll do acting, because okay. my parents wanted me to do something. Right. And so that's what I did. I did the motion pictures and television, MPT. And so, um, and then I did the theater school on the side. Mm -hmm. And I remember I got into comedy because that's what I really wanted to be was a comedian because I was walking down the street right here, right? And the basketball course used to be right there. And there was this, um, there was this old school uh, North African dude, Arab dude, okay. who used to hoop with us every now and then, but he was old, right? And I was walking down the street and he, and I guess he hadn't seen me in a while and I was, I was totally different. I was wearing dress up shirts, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was like trying to be a different person, like right. changing my life. And he pulled up on me. He's like, where are you going? I was like, oh, I'm going to college. You know, I'm going to school right now. I'm walking up to Bart. That boy Bart's like five, 10 minute walk. Right. And he was like, hop in, I'll give you a ride. I was like, oh, for sure. I get in the car, we're driving. He's like, so what you going to school for? I'm going, I was like, I'm going to school for this, but I really want to be a comedian. He was like, it's interesting. My son right here, his son, he's like, I mean, he was like, He's the box office dude at the punchline. Oh, and I didn't shit. know what the punchline was, right? I okay. just wanted to be a comedian, right? Okay. I'm 18. I didn't, I didn't know. I was like, I was like, cool, <laughs> okay. And I mean, it's like, well, you can come by, man, whatever you want. I'll get you in for free. No. And man. I was like, okay. And so the crazy thing is, the first time I ever went to a comedy show was with my friend who got murdered by the police. Oh, <laughs> that's a that's like how deep that memory is, right? And so I started like going every Sunday, like being the only, there was like probably one person other than me. And then there was one kid who would come like once a month, I think who was like 14, but the other kid was 16. But I was the only one who got X's, X's on my hand. Yeah. And I would be in the back of the a punchline with all the youngsters, right? One of the first comedians I ever saw was Bill Burr. I oh, didn't shit. know who he was. Yeah. It's John Mulaney, all these comedians that I would see. And I didn't know the significance of me seeing them. Right. I got to, I eventually ended up working there mm -hmm. as a doorman and I got to smoke weed with Kevin Hart, Robin Williams, uh, fucking the dudes, uh, Broken Lizard, Super Troopers, and all Beer Fest, those guys. Yes. You name it, I got to fucking smoke with them, right? And um, really pick their brain and yeah. learn everything about comedy. Right. 
And uh, I remember when I was a rookie, though, when I was 18, when I first started going to the punch, I was walking at BART going home one day after a show, and I saw one of the local comedians and said, hey, man, how do I get better? I want to be better. Like, I was always the class clown, but I don't, what do I do? To, where's the science in this? And you hadn't been on stage yet? Never. Okay. Okay. Um, and he was like, do improv. And he got on bar and like disappeared into the darkness like Dracula and shit. And yeah. I was just like, improv? What the fuck is improv, right? Yeah. He was a human orb that you saw. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so I researched it and found out Bats Improv was like the top spot in Northern California, blah, blah, blah. And I started going there and saw on weekends, like I already had disconnected from the world. So on weekends while everybody else was like partying and stuff in college. Oh, I was like, I was going to SF State parties when I was in high school. Right. I was going to college parties in high school. I was doing grown shit in high school. So I was like, I passed that stage. You know okay. what I mean? So I was in college every Friday and Saturday. I was at volunteering at the improv theater. And on Sundays, I was at the punchline. Nice. So And then every other day, I was working. So I was working, interning. I started interning at the radio station because I, I came ill. Okay. And so I'm doing all this stuff. I didn't, I didn't have time to hang out or kick it. Right. And so that was like my 20s. I ended up getting fired from the punchline. Drake hired me at Slim's and Great American Music Hall. Yes. And so I started working as a doorman, a bouncer at the music venues because originally I wanted to be into music. So I must I, have seen you at some point. <laughs> you worked there? No, I didn't okay. work, but I would like, go to shows at... More at Great American and Slims, and, yeah. but eventually Punchline. Okay. I don't know if it's after your time, but yeah, I mean, you pr also it's a tiny fucking You probably city. see me. It's a tiny city. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As the doorman, were you like going to all, any show? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, a, like with stand up, yeah, but with the music venues, not so much. Okay. It was more like, if it was a show I liked, I would work it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? More so than uh, than uh, go to watch. Mm -hmm. But I got to appreciate every music, like even heavy metal. I used to be like, what the fuck, heavy metal? <laughs> and then I worked a live show, and I was like, yo, this is crazy. <laughs> right. I love it. So I really got to like become a true San Franciscan with my experience through my 20s. Like I have no regrets in my life. Maybe, maybe leaving law and not graduating from there is one regret I have. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I like I was always the person like if I even if it was risky or I mean I got in a lot of trouble for it for shit I say or whatever but I'm like I'm gonna take the risk you know what okay. I mean like fuck it let's see what happens and with activism started at City College my aunt worked at City College so this is before City College was free so I got every class free nice. so when I finished Academy of Arts I was I went to school for arts but I want to be considered an intellectual. Mm -hmm. I want people to like respect me for my mind. And already as someone who's black, people don't do that. Or mm -hmm. off, off tap, I don't get the benefit of the doubt. So I was like, I'm gonna go to City College and I'm gonna get these free classes. I'm gonna take every class I'm interested in. So when I, also on the level of epistemology, I said, because when I want to speak on a subject, I want to be able to say I've read books, I've taken classes, I've spoken to experts, I have experience. Like, I'm not just speaking from ignorance. I'm speaking from a, a, you know a what deep, you're talking I know about. what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, right. So I took classes from philosophy to science. I took, I taught myself five musical instruments. Like I did four years at City College. One, one semester I did eight classes. Jesus Christ. And people would ask me, they'd be like, what are you here for? I'm like, just to learn. And they're yeah. like, this guy's nuts. <laughs> And then, but City College is how I got involved with activism. Started working with Black Lives Matter, started being a part of all types of BSUs. I would go to different colleges just to be a part of their BSU. I would, I would uh, work with- Like was, all over the state or all nation? All city, the city. The city. Okay. Yeah, I would okay. go to USF's BSU. I'll go to SF State's BSU. I'll go to, all, like, just everywhere. Nice. Um, I started um, working with um, all types of coalitions, you know, feeding homeless people. Um, you know, just you name it, I was doing it, yeah. right? I was just like, I want to just help everything out. What, you know, I didn't feel guilty for like the crime I did back in the day. I felt like it was like the US for the crimes it's did against Native Americans and Africans. I was like, it's our job to haunt the US until they have retribution. You know how you set the spirit free in the ghost horror movies? Yeah. I'm like, they haven't set our spirits free, our ancestors free. So until then we have to haunt these motherfuckers. <laughs> but, um, but so, I, I was doing it just more so because I wanted to make the world a better place. And I, I, want, I want everybody to be happy and feel good. 
and the real reason is just because I want to roast everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as women and LGBTQ and everybody, uh, and blacks and Americans, everybody gets their rights and kids in the cages, everybody, then I can roast you. You can roast the kids in the cages. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, until then, I can't do this. I'm, yeah. ah, I'm going to help free you motherfuckers, and then I'm going to roast your ass. Yeah, let, I, um, let him get out and like, yeah. go to Six Flags, yeah, yeah. and then roast him. <laughs> then roast him. But yeah, so that was a lot of my activism, was just trying to make the world a better place and right. trying, to, trying to do something positive. Can I ask, do you recall, hoping you do, your first time to do stand-up? Yeah. Because to me, I'm oh, sorry, to me, comedy and activism are not necessarily separate things. Not every comedian is an activist, but you're still, you're still using your mind, like hella using your yeah. mind. Yeah, and right? your, your counterculture too, right? Yeah. First I'm the stage. Like, you know, where was it? What was it? Doing? But mostly... Like, how, how did it feel? So, at Lowell, there's a talent show. Yes. And... <laughs> yes. Okay, okay. First of all, at Aptus, there was a talent show, too. And me and my friends... And even... And it was so... I, I'll never forget... I'll never forget this, because we were, like, popular kids. Like, like I said, we weren't the in crowd, but the guys I went with were part of the in crowd. Okay. And we auditioned for the freaking talent show at Aptus. And the people who were judging it knew us. They were our friends. And they still said no. We, 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 we were, they were like, yeah, no, right? And we were rapping our ass off. We were rapping, though. And so at Lowell, I got kind of like some of the more funny kids of, the, of my grade and, I, and some of the football players. I was on the basketball team, right? Okay. We won three city championships while I was there. So, like, it was like we were like, you know, we had some clout. And, um... And I got a bunch of people to say, let's do stand-up, right? Let's do, like, a comedy thing at the low thing. And all of them, like, at the last minute bitched out. Mm. And so it was just me alone. And so oh, then shit. and so then I was like, I'm not going to do it either. But that was the first time I wrote a comedy set out. I was, like, oh. 15, 16 years old, okay. maybe 15. And um, it wasn't even my jokes. I watched BET Comic View <laughs> yeah. for weeks, yeah. writing all the jokes I could make uh, relevant to my life. Right. <laughs> and then I would always, like in middle school, I would study, I would go to lotsofjokes.com and read all these jokes. So I had a bunch of jokes in my back pocket from middle school. Like, so, like I was already deep in the game, like, you know. And so uh, when I was at the punchline, I went on stage a couple times. Like it would be another comedian show and they would bring me on stage to do something. Okay. But it wasn't a set. Right. It was like a one-liner, or they used me for a bit, or like I okay. did a freestyle battle against a, like a 70-year-old woman one time. Yes. Like it was shit like that, you know yes. what I mean? And so the first time I actually hit the stage, I got fired from the punchline. It was, a, it was, it was complex. I'm not going to say anything because I want to perform there. But just know that I wasn't in the wrong, right? Okay. And if I pushed my issue, it could have been a, it could have been a thing. Okay. Um, so... Uh, I I was like it's I'm tired of being scared of this like because I was like I'm you know like I said I'm the kind of person who wants to have all things you know what I mean but sometimes you're not re you'll never be ready you mm -hmm. know you just have to do it mm -hmm. and so I, was, I I talked to Anthony Jezelnik mm -hmm. he happened to be at a show and I asked him you know what should I do before I got fired and he said I took a comedy class mm -hmm. and then it just trampolined me. So at the time, at the time, I was already doing improv classes, very different than stand-up, though, right, right? right? I was already doing deep in the bats and just, you know, really studying that. I've watched so much comedy. Like, I'm a, like growing up, just my dad always played comedy, too. I'm a big South Park fan. Mm -hmm. And so um, I said, okay, I'm going to take a comedy class. I took a comedy stand-up comedy class, mm -hmm. and I did it through the San Jose Improv. Okay. You know, and that's a pretty big comedy club. Mm -hmm. And so the first time getting on stage performing stand-up was in front of my classmates at the San Jose Improv. Okay. And then part of that comedy school was that you got free time at the historic Purple Onion oh, before shit. it shut down. Yeah. So I would, every week, I would be performing at the Purple Onion. Nice. And then right after I finished that course, like my first, I felt like I was official, like ready to do a comedy, I did at the Brainwash. Okay. And then that's where I started getting my like kind of like my chops, right? So your first time maybe wasn't as like nerve wracking as it might have been because you had some. I had so much preparation because yeah. I was so scared. Right. <laughs> so, but I had performed poetry, like with you speaks, mm -hmm. in front of big crowds. 
I have done like rap and stuff like that. I was freestyling on in public, like street performing. So I had did a lot of that, but I had never did stand up. Okay. Oh, I mean, I get, you know, honestly, being the class clown was, I was doing stand up my whole exactly. life. Exactly. Like, yeah. I was the person waiting for a joke, like, boom. Yep. Like, one of the dopest things is I'm the guy at the movie theater who cracks jokes, but I don't interrupt the movie. Right. Like, it's like perfect timing. I'll give you an example. <laughs> First time I noticed I had this power, I was like 13. It was like Freddy versus Jason. Yes. Do you remember that movie? <laughs> yes. We're in the theaters, packed. This is when movie theaters was hot. We mm -hmm. were at the Daily City one right mm -hmm. there. And um, and it was a scene where it was there in the police station. And I remember this vividly because it was such a big laugh I got. And um, the uh, uh, <laughs> the guy, the dude was like, Freddy's back. And the police officer said, like, we don't say his name out loud. And there was like a pause. And right then I go, we'll whisper it there, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole audience is boom, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" Like I'm a, I know how to do a classroom, but this is huge. And then the timing, timing, the timing is, the yeah. timing is crazy. Yes. You and just the nuts to do it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And then the next time was um, this is a little racy. Um, was uh, I am Legend Will Smith? Okay. And he his dog ran into the building, and he was looking for his dog. And he turns a corner and there's a bunch of zombies in a circle making a noise. Right? And I was like, the niggas is circle jerking. <laughs> Killed. <laughs> Killed the whole audience because it was such a tense moment. And the higher level that you push somebody to their like offense threshold or their like tension threshold the bigger the laugh. Absolutely. So there was such a tense moment because they're like, fucking, why is Will Smith going in there, right? And everybody's all like, oh. And then once I said that, it was just like the laughter was un... And I love it. You didn't have to advertise that show. You just, right? You what just you showed up. Well, you showed up and, the, and then you made him laugh. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. So for that oh. moment, it's the Larry Dorsey Jr. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. show. Exactly. That That's, I like that. Because <laughs> advertising takes a lot, man. Yeah. Shit. Can we talk for a minute? Uh, KML. Yeah. So, um... You had mentioned it earlier. I think you said you got an internship there or something. something. Yeah, sorry, that's how I started. Okay, got it. Got and it. then I quit the internship because I was just, you know, you. I mean, eventually you work to work, you you do it to work there. But I felt like it was slavery. Like, yeah, nothing against them, but it was just like internships that are non-paid. You don't like, have to justify quitting an internship. <laughs> <laughs> like, we get it. <laughs> it was rough. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was already doing, like I said, two jobs. Right? I was working at the punchline, and I was working at the 49ers stadium. And then I was uh, going to school at the Academy of Arts, going to school at the private theater. Then I was also interning at BATS all at the same yeah. time, right? So I was just like, it's, something's got to give. You just didn't sleep. It, yeah, I was, yeah. no, I did. It's just, I'm, I'm a very time management kind of person. Okay. Like I don't, I don't drink, I don't party. I don't go to this day, I don't club. I don't like, I don't like kickbacks or hanging out. Mm -hmm. Like not, nothing against it. I have no judgments it's towards anybody. Everybody deserves to be happy and do whatever they want to do. Right. Just for me, I would always feel like, like when I was a bouncer after the show during breakdown, especially if I was getting a ride with my friends or going with them, I would be at the bar reading a book. Mm. That was me. Okay. And I'd be reading a book. Like I also bounced at the chapel and after shows, like during breakdown or the last couple of minutes, I'd be reading a book at the bar yep. and I don't drink. So I'm just chilling there sober as hell. <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, so I, uh, five years later after I finished, uh, uh, at City College, I did my radio show. I did a radio show at Mutiny Radio. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right, just kind of just wiggling. And um, after I finished City College, I decided to, uh, I had enough credits and everything to go back to school or whatever to SF State. And then I went there for creative writing. Okay. But um, while, during that transition, uh, I ran into the manager at the time and he said, hey man, we don't have, we, we stopped doing internships. And we need people, we need to hire people now who know what to do. You, you want to come back to the radio? And I, I was like, hell no. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And then I seen another person like a while later and they're like, yo, we need like, we need some workers. You down? And I was like, all right. I went in for the interview. I knew them already. They remember me, hired me. Okay. The next month, because of my activism, they put me on street soldiers. Okay. They told me, you're welcome back anytime. They should have never said that. Oh, shit. I went to that, and I didn't get paid. Like, I got paid for everything else, but I didn't get paid to be on that show. Right. I went to that show every week. Okay. To the point where they started having me as one of the people on the show, nice. and to the point where I got a promotion and started working it. Okay. 
So when was that? Um, I've been on air probably like five years. Okay. It was like I started back at iHeartRadio in 2015. Okay. Yeah, and then that's why I got on social media because at the radio station, one, they're like, you need it, right? Because you're now in entertainment, mm -hmm. but also because people were like, dude, you're so funny. Like I was doing skits for the, the, the radio station's Instagram and stuff, but I didn't even have my own. And they're like, no, you gotta start, you gotta get your, you gotta get an Instagram. And so, yeah, so that's how I started getting back into that. And because of my humor, I got into the, the morning show as the man on the street. And then because of my continuous activism community stuff, I started like driving for pride, like the, um, you know, pride, right? The, the pride parade. parade. Yeah, 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 pride yeah, yeah. parade. I would be like driving I remember it. Floats. We don't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, it. A long time ago or something. Um, the before times. And then I would, um, what else would I do? I got my own show, like a community base show right and um yeah so that's what i that's how i got involved with iheart radio and then just this year i got promoted to main stage company at bats improv damn and then last Full year circle. before the pandemic started i had gotten passed at the san jose improv as a featured comedian so like a lot of things were happening to me before the before the pandemic <laughs> that I was ready, I was like, yeah, this is my year. 2020 was supposed to be my year. Yeah. And then it wasn't my year, but I still, like I'm, I was able to navigate cause I have a hundred year life plan. So like all, like if I showed you my life plan, like I have my life planned out till I'm 101. Okay. Week by week. This is my daily oh, plan. Okay. Just right for y'all listening then, this is real yeah these are all my notes for everything i do in my life and they're all very detailed and very long right okay. like i could go through jokes i could go through knowledge like the most recent thing i wrote is consistency will always be critique right hmm. and so i have all these like i'm like uh, writing all the time ideas boom, boom boom so my life is planned out so much that although i have everything laid out of what I'm supposed to do, I have contingency plans. Right. And I'm never bored, I always have something I could do. So when the pandemic hit, although I'm, my heart goes out to everybody suffering and people going through it, me, I'm, I'm, I believe in pro noia, right? The universe is conspiring in my favor and I'm an optimistic person, even though I know reality is very painful. I, so I was like, yo, this gives me an opportunity to work on everything I didn't finish. All the projects that were left in, incomplete. You did a pivot. I did a quick pivot. Then I did a back step, pump fake, and a little layup. <laughs> so so the, the pandemic was good to me. I am privileged in the sense that I still live with my parents, you know what I mean? So I don't have like hella bills and hella things that I need. And I'm a minimalist, so I have no wants. Like I don't buy clothes, I don't, you know, I don't have anything I want to do. Travel, that's it, you know what I mean? It's a good way to live. So I have no, like Buddhism wanting is the beginning of all suffering. So yeah. I'm, I'm content. Can I seize on something I just heard you say? You said you're an optimist. Yeah. Can we wrap with um, what your what your hopes are for the city? I feel we're like we're at one of those turning points that the city always goes through every decade or so, especially with like how severe the pandemic is. I'm gonna say is not was, um, and and the the racial and social uprising on the scale that it is currently starting last year. Um, we feel like. The city's turning a corner. It could be a lot of things. What are your hopes for it? For your, well, for, I mean, this is your home. I believe in the preservation and the, the encouragement of culture and arts. And I think that the city has lost the soul, like the heart has been stripped out of it. It's very robotic. And that yeah. probably has to do with the tech boom, right? Um, so that's what my hopes are, you know, like we were discussing before we started, it's the hyphy movement. Mm -hmm. I grew up in that, you know what I mean? I grew up in the go the Mac Dre and the, ooh, the dancing, the sideshows, the, the parties, all that. Like I was a part of that, like big time. The, the wearing the colorful spray painted shirts. I got this grill, I, got, I bought it when I was 15. Wow. From Mr. Bling Bling over there on, in Film Mall, yeah. right next to uh, Boom Boom Boom. Boom Boom Boom. Yeah, I love that place. <laughs> so I used to get my clothes at the corner store up the street from my house, you know what I mean? Yeah. With the sparkly stuff and where's your bow jeans? Yeah. And, you know, so the my hope for the city is, is that the culture, the youth, 
continues to be original because I feel like we're because we're so connected as human beings, which is a good thing. And the exchange of culture is deep. But there tends to be in a homogenization where everybody's doing the same thing now. They used to be able to go to San Francisco and hear slang or hear hear music and be like, oh, that's San Francisco. Right. But now it's like everybody sounds like everywhere else in the country. You know what I mean? Like there it, actually in the city is how deep it was. There used to be a, a when I was growing up. You could look at someone the way they dress and tell what part of the city they're from. And what high school, right? Yes. Yeah. You'd be you would be like, oh, that nigga's from over here. That, oh, oh, he's from over here, yeah. right? The slang they use. Right. Oh, they're from this part of the city. So. I really, I really think that that's a big thing that needs to be. That's what I. That's my hope for the city, you know. And for me as a native son, um, that's what I hope to do. And I'm gonna continue going for it. Like my my goal is to be in Pixar doing voices and be work on SNL and stuff like that. Like I'm gonna move to New York. Like I'm not gonna be in the city. This is not where I'm gonna die. You okay. know. I'm going to I'm going to be good. once I go I'm going to move to New York, I'm going to move to LA, like I'm gone. Like I'm probably never going to come back. I'll come back to visit of course, but not to live. I 30 years here like I'm done, you know. Okay. <laughs> I, I've exhausted it. Like I did the the radio, the top hip hop station, the top improv, top comedy. I'm done, you know what I mean? I did what I could do. You know, racially like the I believe a lot. Everybody's fighting for whatever they want to fight for, any type of issue, right? Um, you know, whatever the issue is, like human rights. Everybody's fighting for something. My, I've boiled it down because of all the things I've been a part of. I just believe in reparations. Boom, break, break us off, right? The African descendants of slavery. Break us off some bread. Um, and then the message to Africans, them, African descendants themselves. The goal, the key for us, is Pan-Africanism, mm. and I'm a, and, and that's all I, ha I have to say because it could get so complex, right? Of oh, this, of oh, this, and you did defund and this and this. There's so many things. I'm like, yo, you know what? I'm gonna focus on reparations. Not that I believe in capitalism, mm -hmm. but it's more so that it's old, right? Mm -hmm. And so, boom, break that off. You know, you know what this deep, bro? That I just really thought of is history revisionism or re revisionist history. Mm -hmm. Like we're getting to a point now where people are gonna be so offended. We're actually living in some of the easiest times in human history, right. but people have so much to complain about. Mm -hmm. We're we're gonna, in a point where people are gonna, like I've he heard this in San Francisco, parents were complaining that slavery was taught in school because it made their kids guilty of being white. So I'm like, yo, yeah. if <laughs> like, it's there's Holocaust deniers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's people who say slavery wasn't that bad and get over it. There's, there's, you know what I mean? Like, there's people, if if we if we don't watch out, we're gonna we're gonna repeat a lot of historical things because people are too offended that there even exists. And human nature is is there's never been a time in human nature where it hasn't been violence or evil. Okay. If a lion sees an uh, antelope, the lion is not gonna go antelope lives matter. <laughs> the lion is gonna kill the antelope. Right. And we are animals when it comes down to it, yeah. right? I don't believe in Adam and Eve. I don't believe in none of that. I don't believe in religion, none of that. I believe that we're all equal, love, peace, and happiness, seek knowledge. Like, that's what I believe in. Treat everybody as you want to be treated. And historically, humans are evil as shit. And that's what it is. And I, I didn't wish it was that way, but that's what it is. And if we don't watch out, if, we're, if everybody's trying to erase things because it's offensive, we're going to end up in a point where we're going to be repeating a lot of these things. Mm. And, you know, that's the documentary Sea Spiracy just came out about, like, all that kind of, you know what I mean? Like, there's so much... There's so much evil in the world, so my hope is that is is education is such a broad word but it's like the value of human life needs to be needs to go up and and i you know honestly like i said about humans like it's just our nature dude like i i feel so <laughs> i feel i feel like 
sometimes attacked because of my positivity. Mm -hmm. Like, my dad always says, you better be careful. People don't like that happy shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, like, you better right. not go to prison. Yeah. That happy shit ain't going to be cool. Because I'm the kind of person, people around me, I'm like happy on this, huh? <laughs> right? And, and I've had people get mad at me for that. I've had people hate on me, get jealous, or have weird energy towards me mm -hmm. because I'm like a positive person. And so I feel like there needs to be a big, you know, the next revolution is going to be spiritual. We have had uh, industrial revolution, technical revolution. We had civil rights, human rights. We've had the, right now women are going through the Me Too movement. We've had we have the transgender, the, the, the LGBT. We have all these movements going on. But the next one is going to be a spiritual, philosophical movement that brings us all together, where we understand that we're all the fucking same. That was Larry Dorsey Jr. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, you'll get to know Rusty Smith and Tomas Moreno of My Tree Compassionate Care. Episode 9 drops next Tuesday. Music for the podcast was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Original photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. The show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our fourth season, we have nearly 150 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you can, subscribe, rate, and review our show so that we can reach even more folks. And if you'd like to drop us an old-fashioned email, we'd love it. The address is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.